Well, up until this point, we've been working on our uh, qualitative understanding of how charges interact. Uh, now, of course, it's time to put some numbers with this as well. Uh, so let's look at the case where we have two charges, say one a positive charge and one a negative charge. And uh, for charges, we use the variable Q. So Q just represents the amount of charge that an object has and we use the units of coulombs for this. Coulombs or a capital C. Uh, so the coulomb is, um, well, it's, it's a pretty big unit as far as uh, charges go. So when we look at uh, these first problems, we're going to be looking at you know, protons and electrons. and So the amount of charge stored is going to be really, really, really tiny. Like 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. But even when they look at really uh, you know, much more charged up things, um, if you got zapped with a coulomb of charge, uh, you would feel that. that. That would be a serious zap. So coulombs, they're, they're really pretty big units then. Uh, so if we have these two charges, and the question is, uh, you know, how, how big a force do they experience? Uh, in, in this case, it would be an attractive force, because they're opposite charges. Well, you might get some idea that the amount of force that each one experiences, well, we know it's going to be the same, F. You might get some idea that the amount of force probably depends on the amount of charge that we have there. So we've got Q1 and Q2. And uh, you know the, the product of the two makes sense with what we know about how gravitation works. We also have probably some idea that the distance between those matters and that the farther apart they get, um, the bigger that distance is going to be. So let's call that distance R. And we'll put that on the bottom. And actually it turns out that it's not R, but R squared that this changes with. And so to, to understand this, we might think of um, this negative charge, for example. We could do it for the positive charge also. But for this negative charge, it could influence anything that's this same distance uh, equally. So its, it's influence is spreading out in kind of the shape of a, a sphere here. So if we had a sphere that was you know, along the distance uh, uh, r, from this first charge, that sphere would uh, would represent you know, the effect that this has on any object that's this far away, that's r away, and uh, so that that sphere has a surface area of four pi r squared, and uh, so that that influence is spread out over the surface of the sphere. So we have our q1, q2 over four pi r squared. And then, you know, generally we have some kind of a constant C in here just to kind of work as a conversion factor, um, you know, to, to get this thing in the right units, to get it into newtons. Uh, so the, the form that we use for this is, is a little bit different. Um, you know, so first off we might say, well, you know, 4 pi is a constant, so we might as well just get rid of that and you know, change our, our constant value a little bit here. Um, and so we can do that when we do we make it a k, and uh, that that value k, that's just called the Coulomb's Law constant. So this expression that, that tells us about the, the amount of force between two charges, we just call that Coulomb's Law. Um, but actually there's, there's another way to represent this that we see pretty commonly, and that's this way. Instead of getting rid of the 4 pi, we bring that to the left over here, and then it turns out that uh, this epsilon naught right here uh, that's that's a constant that uh, it turns out pops up in a lot of different equations, including this one. So you know, if we just use a, a you know a value of c here, c divided by four pi, it turns out has this interesting relationship then with uh, with epsilon naught, um, and so you know, usually we just write it out in in this uh, in this way. Um, now the exam uh, equation sheet that you get for the AP exam lists out not only the value for epsilon naught, but actually the value for 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which is how this equation is written out. So this whole thing is the same as a, a, the k, 
So that's the Coulomb's law constant. That has a value of 9.0 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. So if we have uh, units of Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared here, the meters squared in this constant will cancel out with the meters squared from the R squared. The Coulomb squared will cancel out the Coulombs in each of our two charges there, and we're left just with units of Newtons, which is what we ought to have with uh, a force. So let's try this equation out. Let's say we're looking for the strength of the electric force between the proton and the electron in a typical hydrogen atom. So we call that a 1-1 hydrogen atom. That means uh, the, the top number here is the number of protons. The bottom number is the atomic mass. And so you know, this one is just one proton and one electron. Now a hydrogen atom, it has a total width here of about one angstrom. And one angstrom is 10 to the neg or one to the negative uh, one times 10 to the negative 10th uh, meters. So this is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. So that would make this little distance um, 0.5 times 10 to the negative 10th or 5 times 10 to the negative 11th meters. And then the value for the charge on a proton is the same as the value for the charge on an electron. They're just opposite in, uh, in charge. And that charge is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So let me do our calculation. Force is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q1, q2, over r squared. So force is equal to the 1 over 4 pi epsilon, not just do that, all is one value, that's the 9.0 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per coulomb squared, times up top we've got 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, times the same thing, so we'll just square that, and then our distance between them, that's 5 times 10 to the negative 11th meters, and that gets squared as well, and we get a value for force, in this case, of 9.2, oops, 9.2 times 10 to the negative 9th, sorry, negative 8th newtons. So a little tiny force, but we expect a little tiny force on a little tiny object like this. Um, so that at least makes some kind of sense you know, qualitatively that way. Um, and then uh, you know, this one, we actually have uh, a negative 1.60 and a positive 1.60. So it's not really a positive one squared here. It's just for uh, convenience sake doing this calculation. So we get a negative. 9.2 times 10 to the negative eighth newtons. Now what does the negative mean here? Well that just means it's an attractive force. So when this electrostatic force, when this comes out as a negative, that's going to be an attractive force. That happens when we have one positive and one negative. Or if we have two positives or two negatives, we'll get a positive force and that's going to be a repulsive force. All right, let's take this one step further and not just look at um, the, the force, but actually the motion of some charged particle under the influence of these forces. Um, so you know, one place where we might be interested in this, again, is in an atom and how the electrons move around the atom. Uh, so we're considering the, the Bohr model of an atom here, and we were in the last problem too, I just didn't mention that. Um, it, this is actually a little less complicated than um, what we believe now is, is the true nature of an atom with electron clouds and um, quantum chromodynamics and statistical, um, or sorry, probabilistic um, reality instead of deterministic reality. And there's just a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on is the, the gist of this. So 
we simplify it and we say, yeah, we got a little positive guy in the middle and we got a negative guy that goes around the outside and it looks just like a planet orbiting the sun. That's the Bohr model. It works to make some pretty good predictions still, even though we know this isn't really the way it happens, however you want to define you know, real here. Uh, so, in this case, we have you know, basically circular motion. So we can use this idea that the net force in the centripetal direction is equal to um, the, uh, uh, whoops, uh, no, that was right, m v t squared over r. All right, and so our, our centripetal force here, the, the force that pulls these things together, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. It's just that electric force times q1, q2 over r squared. That's equal to m v t squared over r. So let's say we're looking for the, the speed here uh, of this electron as it goes around. Um, so I'll multiply both sides by r to get rid of that and get rid of 1r here. Then I'll divide both sides by m. So we get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q1 q2 over r m is equal to vt squared. And the square root of both sides. And I don't know why, but I always like to have my lone variable on the left side here. So the square root 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and then q1, q2 in the numerator, r, m in the denominator. Okay, so let's plug in some values here. Square root, we know 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, that's equal to 9.0 times 10 to the 9th. That's Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. And then we've got, let's see, Q1 and Q2. Those are both going to be the 1.60 times 10 to the negative 9th coulombs. So we'll just square that value. Divided by the distance, we had that in the last problem too. 5 times 10 to the negative 11th meters. Um, and then times the mass, and we're talking about the mass of an electron here, which are really, really, really tiny. Uh, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. That is a tiny little thing. Uh, so now V, and I just noticed here I had a calculation error there, so that uh, I, I wrote this wrong, so that's uh, negative 19th for coulombs, not uh, 10 to the negative 9th. That, it turns out, is a pretty important thing to get right here. Um, so when we calculate this, then we get Vt is equal to 2.25 times 10 to the 6th meters per second, uh, which is even faster than I can run. It's like, uh, you know, one percent of the speed of light. So that's quick. It's very, very quick. 200 or 2.25 million meters in a second or uh, 2,000, two, or sorry, yeah, 2,250 uh, kilometers in just one second. So extremely, extremely fast. These electrons are moving around. Now we know that the Bohr model isn't really the, the best way to think of this in, uh, in a lot of different si situations. We know that it doesn't really look like planets going around in a circle around the sun. Um, it's more of a cloud. It's, uh, so it's, it's a very complicated situation there. The motion of electrons is um, complicated as well, even if we don't think of it just as a circular path. Uh, the motion is well, it's, it's odd. It's tough to describe the motion. Uh, so does it make sense to say that you know, this is moving at a 2.25 uh, times 10 to the 6 meters per second as it goes around in circles? Well, you know, to, to some extent that's okay to say, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll discuss in more detail when we get to nuclear physics um, you know, what exactly that electron is, is actually doing, how it is actually moving 
uh, around that uh, that nucleus.